Welcome to the final episode of this series of The Gadget Show. We wanted to go out with a bang, have a unique idea for the final show that you'd all remember. So, it's summer, we want something special. Go speedboats, go beach babes. Welcome to the summer special. Oh, oh give us that hat, mate. Oh, coat, please, mate, anything. And so, what's in our sparkling summer special? Susie photographs fish in Mexico underwater, all in the interest of testing waterproof cameras. She also tests a pretty cool gadget that can make deep sea divers out of all of us. John's been on a day trip to Blackpool to learn just how to take the best holiday snaps you can. We give you some pretty useful advice on how to make sure you're getting the best deals when buying gadgets abroad. Tom Dunmore's got some advice on the best gadgets to pack when you're going away. And I've got a great big water pistol fight with some of the hardest men I've ever met. It's the Gadget Show versus the Gurkhas, and I think we're going to lose. But first, here's Susie on some rocks in Mexico. Two things that you can guarantee that most people will do on holiday, go swimming and take pictures. But for a long time, both of those activities were mutually exclusive. Unless you spend a fortune on specialist underwater kit, getting your camera wet was fatal. These days, though, you can have your cake and get it wet, whether you go for a fully waterproof camera or one that comes with a waterproof housing. But which camera offers the best combination of being great for everyday use and brilliant in the wet stuff? I've come to the stunning Caribbean coast of Mexico to test them out with a spot of underwater wildlife photography. Before we get onto our cameras, we wanted to mention these. Aquapacks come in sizes to fit most cameras, and they're a good cheap way of making your existing camera waterproof. But beware, if you don't squeeze all of the air out before you use them, it's like swimming with an armband. Right, onto our chosen three. This Pentax is one of only a few cameras on the market that's waterproof in its own right. It's tiny, which makes it easy to swim with, but it's limited. You can't go any deeper than one and a half meters, and you can only stay in the water with it for 30 minutes. Pentax say any longer, and the combination of time and pressure means water could start to get in. The Fuji F11 is one of the Gadget Show's favorite cameras, and it has its own underwater case. It's got a fast shutter speed, even in low light, so you're less likely to get blurred photos. The Sea Life is one of the most popular cameras for divers. The casing is made of easy to grip rubber, and if you get really into underwater photography, there's a range of accessories like digital flash that you can buy to go with it. All three are waterproof, but you must make sure that they're free of grit and locked properly. Before you take them in the sea, it's best to try them out in a little bit of fresh water. So just put them in, give them a swill round, make sure that there's no air bubbles, because that would obviously indicate a leak and take them out, turn it on and hope it works. Bingo. This may seem obvious, but it's vital. The last thing you want is to get on your holiday and find you've got a leak. Time for the tests. I can't see the gadget show sending me to swim with dolphins on a regular basis, so I want to get a good shot. First, I'm going to try it with the sea life. It's pretty easy to use. The only problem I found is that you've got to make sure you depress that button completely to make sure that you get your shot. Now, because it's so bright, because the sun's so bright, we're on the surface, it's difficult to see the shots that you've actually got. So you've just got to really take and hope. But I think when we go underwater with that one, it might be quite good. I'm going to try the Pentax next. The one thing I was concerned about with this, because the buttons are very flat, was switching it off and not realising. But you can actually see the back of the screen quite well, so you can see if you've done that. So that wasn't too much of a problem. Fine picks. 
The Fuji is the least intuitive to use, but once I get used to it, it does produce some good shots. However, both the cameras with housings do fog up from time to time, which can be a real nuisance. After a day with the dolphins, I'm off to see some local sport, fireball. A bizarre ancient game involving sticks, bare feet and, oh, a ball of fire. The challenge here for our cameras is to cope with the contrast between the low nighttime light and the bright ball of fire. All three still have the digital camera problem of shutter lag. The Sea Life and Pentax don't perform well in the low light, but the Fuji's fast shutter speed on its nighttime setting means that it gets the shot every time. There's very little blurring and there's good definition across the whole scene. So the unique selling point on these cameras is that they are supposed to be able to take really good pictures underwater and there is only one way to find out. It's a windy day and the sea's fairly choppy, so it's not easy to hold the camera steady, which makes taking photos difficult. The fact the Pentax is light and simple to shoot makes it best for using when snorkelling. Both the Sea Life and the Fuji are a bit bulky to handle. When it comes to consistency, the Pentax also wins. Unlike the Sea Life and the Fuji, very few of its pictures are blurred. However, when the other two do take a decent photo, it tends to be better because the colours are stronger. Well, the Pentax has to leave us now because it can only go down to one and a half metres. However, these guys can go a lot deeper. But which one will perform the best in the deep blue? Swimming 30 feet below the waves, there's less of a current, so taking pictures is far easier. And there's no shortage of good subjects either. It's like finding Nemo down here. Both cameras coped well with the very blue low light, but if I was to choose one, then I'd have to say the sea life creates the truest image of the underwater world. The pictures are more colourful and just that bit sharper. So, after a couple of lovely sunny days by the sea, it's time to come to some conclusions. If you're on holiday and you're just horsing around with your mates in the sea, the Pentax is great because it's so small you can just put it in your pocket. Also, the screen on this one is really good. Even in bright sunlight like now, you can see the picture that you've taken. And it gets the shot more often than not. But of the lot, I like the Fuji the best because it's the great all-rounder. From fireball to dolphins to 30 feet down with turtles, this is the Gadget Show's favourite underwater holiday camera. Now it's time for another of our guides aimed at helping you get the most from your gadgets. This week, how to check you're getting a good deal buying gadgets abroad. This summer, any gadget fan worth their salt will be keeping an eye out for bargains while on holiday. Loads of stuff is cheaper abroad, isn't it? Well, not necessarily. And the last thing you want is to fill your bags with goodies, only to discover that they're cheaper back home. So, how do you check that you're getting a good deal when shopping for gadgets abroad? To check where to go to buy specific items before you hit the shops, use the price comparison website Price Runner. Choose the item you're after from the product list and click International Prices. You'll then see the list of stores where you can find it for the cheapest in each different country. And it's hardly ever the UK. If you spot a bargain while out and about abroad, you'll want to check it's not cheaper at home. Lots of price comparison sites offer a text service so that you can compare shop prices to those on the web but some, like Text for Price, can check UK prices wherever you are in the world. Text FIND to plus 44 778 147 4397, along with the product name, for example, Sony PSP, being as specific as you can. Then they'll text you back the lowest available price in the UK. This will cost you 25p on top of your normal international text charges, but only if they find your product. You now have the price of the cheapest PSP available in the UK. 
But unless you know the exchange rate off by heart, you still don't know if the one you've found abroad is cheaper. There are plenty of websites that offer up-to-date rates, but if you haven't got a web browser on your phone, then you can use WAP to access XE.com's currency converter, which holds every currency rate in the world. In your WAP browser, go to XE.com, then choose Converter. Enter the amount you want to check and choose the currency from the list. You'll get the current rate of exchange there and then. Remember, if you're on holiday outside the EU, there's a limit on how much of anything you can bring back without paying tax. So check the customs website at hmrc.gov.uk for details of allowances. But if you're shopping in the EU, you're laughing. You can buy as much as you want with no worries of being stung for VAT when you get back. When you return from your summer holidays, you want to come back with three things. A good tan, a sexy foreign girlfriend called Emmanuel, and some great photos. Now, unfortunately, I can't help you with the first two, but I do know somebody who can help you take better pictures. Meet Annabelle Williams. She's won numerous awards for her photos. Her trademark photographic style is relaxed informality, which makes it easy for people without masses of time and equipment to emulate it. Best of all, she's also an experienced photographic teacher, so I thought I'd join her on your behalf for a quick holiday masterclass. In the most holiday-centric place in Britain, Blackpool. Blackpool's most famous and most photographed landmark is its tower. A straight-on snap that fills the frame is the most obvious photo, but change the perspective and you'll get something much more interesting. We've chosen a view that includes Europe's tallest roller coaster and an interesting promenade sculpture. So how do we get the most out of this view? Try to, turning your camera on a slight angle as well, because that really helps. If you take something straight, yeah. it's kind of realistic and what's there. But if you actually tilt your camera very slightly to the left, um, mm. you get a slight angle and it makes the picture much more dynamic and interesting. Ooh. Rather than trying to encapsulate your experience in one shot, Annabelle's fond of sequences of shots at different scales. We've got the wide angle, now we need some close-ups. I really like the silver railings here, yeah. with the concrete. The patterns of those concrete things look fantastic, and then it goes out to sea with the beach and the, yes. and the Again, you want to, water. I sense you want to put them at an angle. Oh, yeah, I like everything at an <laughs> angle. <laughs> I mean, talking of landscape details, these concrete bolts that form Blackpool's sea defences look absolutely fantastic. The only question is, is it the memory of Blackpool you want to take away with you? I'm not sure. Perhaps this is a more appealing subject. Another Blackpool landmark is the world's biggest glitter ball. So, we've got a few more individual shots of Blackpool that we can call our own. Hung together on the wall back home, they'll be an excellent reminder of our day out. But holidays aren't just about the scenery. They're also a great opportunity to take photos of people because they're so relaxed, or at least they should be. Even little people who normally tire very quickly of the camera can become perfect models when they're on holiday. We've bribed a photogenic family with free fish and chips to spend the day with us in Blackpool getting chilly and having their photos taken. So, taking pictures of your kids on holiday, what are you looking for? Um, really, we're looking for the kids obviously having fun on a beach or wherever they might be. And it's quite nice if you think about the location they're going to be in first rather than just focus on the children immediately because often you get home with your snaps and your kids look great but there's something awful in the background. The vast emptiness of the beach provided all the background we needed. And Annabelle gave the children something to do so they'd play naturally without running out of shot. Can you, you make your name now for me? You write the cuff, that's it. Can you do it? Can you do yours, Bradley, as well, at the same time? So mm. while they're actually... Mm. See, they're actually... Is that this a, is a great good warming up now? exercise. Yeah, do you it's, it's a really great picture now because they're actually doing something so we can record them. Rather than standing staring at us, yeah. we can actually get them yeah. taking pictures. Yeah. 
As with our landscape photos, Annabelle was after a sequence that would tell the story of the children's day out. And the results certainly looked better than plonking them in front of the nearest monument and hoping for the best. All for a few extra minutes' thought. That's the children sorted, but what about the adults? They're far harder to get relaxed. They're far more likely to be paranoid about looking too old or looking too fat. Old bag of worries, in fact. For photos of the children's mum and gran, we're going to the pleasure beach. Unusually, it's closed and crowd-free. That's fantastic. Look at all the colours. Yeah. Look at the blue there. That's amazing. We should use that what? as a background. The because... garage doors. Yeah, I, I suppose <laughs> it is, but it will look fantastic with the colours that they've got on because they've got, like, bright blue jackets. Yeah. And Emma's got really lovely... Well, they've both got really lovely dark hair. Annabelle's fond of abstract backgrounds for portraits in colours that complement what people are wearing, like these shutters. We'll take you over to this blue door here. Now, the first thing we'll do, if you just both lean any old how against the wall, anything like, oop, <laughs> can't lean against this wall. <laughs> right, if you just have to lean sort of gently against this wall, any old how, and then we'll arrange it from there. Right. I'll bring your shoulders back around this way a little bit more. We're not going for a head-on approach, I see. Oh, no, no, right, no, we're trying, because it's not flattering. If you have somebody facing you straight on, Mm. Um, it look, they look much fatter than they are normally. And most people do that. They would stand in front of Blackpool Tower, for instance, and say... Straight on. Yeah, I'm like here. this, and, yeah. and look much fatter. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to almost get an S-shape from somebody, turning oh, them sideways right. and getting mm. a sort of curve. If you think of beauty queens years mm. ago that all used to stand in that sort of curve with a sash right. around them, you know, the sort of thing. To get people looking at their best, stay out of bright sunlight and stick to the shade. Soft light is more flattering. Disguise a double chin by pushing it forward and look up at the camera to get baby innocent eyes and make the wrinkles fall away. What I'm going to remember most from my day out is to try putting the camera at an angle, to look out for those abstract backgrounds and at all costs to put my elderly relatives in the shade. Encouragingly, all our shots were taken on compact cameras and I think they're pretty good. Now it's time for our regular look at some of the coolest gadget stuff around. And this week in our summer special show, here's Tom Dunmore with the critical list, essential holiday gadgets. First up, music. Now, I'm not going to take my iPod video with me. Frankly, it's just too big. I've got a new love now. It's this tiny, slinky iPod Nano. I've even got this Gear 4 speaker to go with it. And while it's not going to rock a party, it's quite enough for a hotel room. Next up, entertainment. Now, I'm really tempted to go for this, the Nintendo Game Boy Micro, and it is a tiny, tiny games console. Unfortunately, it only plays Game Boy Advance games, and there haven't been that many good ones released this year, so I'm going to take this instead. It's the new version of the Nintendo DS, and there are loads of really innovative games out for it. It's just been redesigned, and it's now got this slick iPod white look to it. Now, I fancy writing a novel while I'm on holiday, so I'm going to take a laptop. It's not, as you can see, the biggest laptop in the world. This is a flybook. It runs Windows XP and it can work as a tablet too. You can literally just write on the screen rather than have to worry about sitting up and typing. So hopefully I can come up with an absolute classic. Of course, this is Wi-Fi enabled too and it even has a slot for a SIM card, so if I'm out of range, I could use a GPRS or 3G SIM with it. Of course, I'm going to need something to take the photos and videos to remind myself of what a great time I've had on holiday. So, I'd usually take a Nikon SLR, simply because it produces such fantastic still pictures. But this year, I'm trying something different, because last week, I came across this the Sanyo HD1. Now this takes 5.1 megapixel stills and has a built-in flash, but it also records high-definition video to memory card, which means I'll be able to bore my friend Sensus with super high-quality footage of me prancing about in just a towel. So, that's me then. Job done. But if you do want to travel really light, you could always just take one of these. 
This is the PSP and it's the ultimate travel gadget. It's got Wi-Fi web browsing, so you could do without the laptop. It's got gaming, of course, so you don't necessarily need that Nintendo. It's even got MP3 playback and a built-in speaker, so I could sacrifice my Nano. I now have the added benefit of being able to watch movies on the move, too. That now leaves me enough space for the essentials and even some luxuries, like clothes as well as toys. Right, I'm off. Welcome back to Mexico, this glorious setting with the sun shining and the sound of the waves crashing against the rocks. In fact, I'm just about to go underneath those waves to test a rather unusual underwater gadget. 70% of our planet is covered by water and splashing around in a beautiful warm tropical sea is a dream that keeps most of us going throughout the cold British winter. Although way back in time we evolved from fish, you may be aware that we no longer possess the power to breathe underwater. So, if we want to get close to some of our more distant relatives and pay a visit to our underwater motherland, the only way to do so is to squeeze into a wetsuit, link up to a heavy oxygen tank and dive. There are over 14 million qualified divers, including me, incidentally. It seems a lot until you think that there's six billion of us in the world which means that 99.8% of people can go no further into the ocean than a plastic snorkel and mask will allow. But there are gadgets out there to make going underwater a whole lot easier. Inventions like this, Snuba, lets you dip into the deep without a diving certificate. And you've probably seen this thing in gadget magazines. It's the sea -Doo Silver Sea Scooter, it basically tows you round the water so that you can concentrate on staring at the fish. So, I'm going to give it a go. Well, these things only go about two miles an hour, so don't expect to see any underwater Grand Prix action soon. But I think that's probably a good thing, because I'm quite sure that the coral and the fish wouldn't want us tearing up their home. Right, so a go. Two miles an hour actually feels really fast when you're underwater. This little sea do is very intuitive to use. It simply goes where you point it. But we haven't flown 12 hours to Mexico just to try out a sea do that you can buy in Margate. We've come to see something far more revolutionary, an underwater gadget that will enable everyone to walk with the fishes. And this is it. This helmet is called the Sea Trek and it lets you walk on the seabed, even if you can't swim. Helmet diving has been around since two Englishmen invented the concept in the 1800s. But it's never taken off, until now. The Sea Trek helmets all have a tube at the back of them, which goes up to the surface and connects to a raft, which in turn is attached to an air supply on dry land. As long as you keep the helmet upright, the pressure of the air supply keeps the water out. Thank you. So far, this thing has got a 100% safety record, and I'm hoping, quite frankly, that that's going to continue. Otherwise, you're going to see live footage of a gadget show presenter drowning. Marvellous. When you first go under, you don't feel nervous at all because you continue to breathe normally. But being suddenly surrounded by water is a bit weird. The fish don't seem at all phased by these helmets. To them, I'm just another weird undersea creature. The helmet has a space at the bottom, so you can reach inside if you want to repressurize and clear your ears. The whole thing basically feels quite natural. Oh, thank you. Wow, what an amazing experience that was. Obviously, when they first put the helmet on you when you're out of the water, it's really heavy, but as soon as you go underwater, it just feels like somebody's slightly pressing down on you. Um, when you're walking around, obviously you can't really go anywhere fast, it's like walking on the moon, but the actual experience is fantastic. You can hear the air coming in all the time, and the fish come right up to your face. So if you can't dive or if you can't swim, you've never actually experienced going underwater before, it really is fantastic. At the moment, you have to travel across the Atlantic to try out the Sea Trek helmet, but soon, 
there's going to be a sea trek site in Spain. Then, who knows? Perhaps it'll make its way to the UK. Sea trekking in Skegness, anyone? Well, we've come to the last part in the last episode of the current series of The Gadget Show. That's right, you're going to have to go an entire summer before we return. But as you might have gathered watching this week's summer special, gadgets and summertime go together like Greek men and infeasibly small trunks. That's right, Stavros, I'm talking about you. But as far as I'm concerned, there is one gadget that summer was made for. It can easily turn a pleasant sunny afternoon into a cataclysmic orgy of conflict. I am, of course, talking about the water pistol. Never has so much summer fun been squeezed into such small and brightly coloured lumps of plastic. Water pistols are silly, ridiculous, childish and inane. But choosing the right one should be taken as seriously as choosing any other part of your gadget arsenal. OK, gentlemen, stand easy. Your water weapons fall into three distinct categories. First up, the simple Storm. A basic pump-action sidearm, its unique secret weapon, laser sighting. Next up, an exotic weapon, the Shield Blaster, Shield 1000. It's got a railgun offensive capability and an armour-plating defensive capability. And finally, the daddy of water pistols, the Super Soaker. The Super Soaker first appeared in the late 1980s and has dominated the water pistol world ever since, mainly due to its patented design. Invented by Lonnie Johnson, an aerospace engineer from Los Angeles, the pumping up of pressure in the water reservoir greatly increases range and power. There are four Super Soakers that interest us, gentlemen. First up, the triple shot. The most interesting thing about this gun is the nozzle, enabling to deliver three different types of water-based ordnance. First up, a defensive nozzle. Second, sniper barrel. Third, shotgun. Next up, the Arctic Shock. This water reservoir takes a unique frozen core, enabling you to seriously ice your enemy. Now, for many people, their favourite weapon is the flash flood. This unique device offers two offensive capabilities, a long-range sniper barrel, and my personal favourite, the water grenade launcher. But for the soldier that just will not stop, Tim, the Max Infusion Overload. To all intents and purposes, a normal water gun. Tim, turn around, please. But on his back, a high-intensity water reservoir that will keep you in the battle for hours. Tim, have you been working out? Yep. Looking good, soldier. It's all well and good having the world's finest arsenal of water weapons, but the question you really want answered is which is best. Well, in True Gadget Show style, we came up with a whole host of different tests. We came up with tests to see which one fired the furthest. 3 metres 90, 4 metres 30, 8 metres 20. We thought we should maybe see which holds the most water. And we thought about testing which one has the strongest jet. Fairly strong. Next. <laughs> Crikey. But, you know, science can only go so far. If you really want to know which one of these is best in a combat situation, you need to organise a great big fight. And that's exactly what we've done. Let me introduce you to the first of our teams, some of the hardest soldiers on Earth, the Gurkhas. This lot are actually ex-Gurkhas. They're so hard that they now make up a much sought-after close protection bodyguard unit. So, if you think someone might be out to get you, then these are the blokes you want around you. So that's the opposition. Now it's time to meet the real warriors, the Gadget Show team. <laughs> Oh, no. As the playing field for our battle royale, we'd chosen an old ammo dump. It's a dizzying maze of concrete alleys and dead ends. Sort of like our own personal level of doom. And what's the first rule of gadget show water pistol fights? Well, it's that there are no rules. Oh, 
Right from the off, the Gurkhas rushed us gadget show misfits and had us pinned down. In this sort of heavy duty fight, the smaller pistols proved insubstantial. The need to refuel so often meant it was impossible to put up the sort of defence that an onslaught from half a dozen angry Gurkhas demands. <laughs> After being pinned down for what seemed like days, we organised one big push and heroically forced the pros back into a defensive position. The shield blasters, those are the guns with the windy handles, were highly effective in the hands of the Gurkhas, allowing plenty of frontline cover, while other team members refuelled. After our brief period of dominance, the Gurkhas' superior tactics, organisation and bigger guns were what finally won the day. They pushed us back and back, at one point isolating John and making him pay a severe price for that hat. From here on in, the result was inevitable, and eventually we had to surrender, leaving the Gurkhas to celebrate another victory that's sure to be remembered in the regiment for a long time to come. So if you find yourself up an alley being chased by a pack of water pistol touting Gurkhas, what's the best weapon to choose to give you a fighting chance of survival? Both the Gadget Show team and the Gurkhas agree that this is the water pistol of choice, the Super Soaker Flash Flood. It doesn't shoot the furthest or the hardest, but it'll do this to Tim. Sorry, mate, it is the end of the series.